Give us a light, mate. We... You can't smoke in here. Yes, I can. Watch. <laughs> Well, you know, after, after the American tour, which ended in March 2002, we sort of came back to England and wrote some new songs, but, you know, frankly, we were cream crackered, you know, knackered. We played our last date together as a band at the Isle of MTV show in Portugal around, when was it? Uh, it was June 2002, I think. And that was it. And after that, we just concentrated on trying to make this sort of turdy gorillas film. Yeah, well, we got so many offers to make a film in America. At a time, it seemed like a waste not to take the opportunity. So we all moved over to L.A. for a while, you know, La La Land, and uh, we sort of hired this big house out in the sort of kind of uh, like a Hollywood thing, you know, it's like up in the hills, you know, so that we could sort of, you know, sort of be right in the hub, you know what I'm saying? In the hub of, of where we were sort of meant to be filming. but. I've got to say, you know, man, there was a lot of great distractions, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and the film negotiations were just endless. Oh, man, I was just, like, really, really tedious, you yeah. know? Yeah, we got caught up in rehearsals, meetings, script approvals. Oh, the script was unfinished. The people writing it thought they were making a very insightful yet ironic comment on popular culture, a supposedly non-linear Charlie Kaufman-esque anime in which the four main protagonists, namely gorillas, fall randomly in and out of a number of surreal situations. But in fact, the scriptwriters were just like, um, making it up as they went along. Um, will you wake us up when you finish, Noodle? <laughs> uh, I guess what she's trying to say is they thought it was going to be like a modern version of the monkey's movie Head. Yeah, yeah, the thing is, uh, the, the person they chose to play me looked like some old wrinkly geriatric, you know? It's really insulting. You know, and, and he smelt, you know? What a pen and ink, you know? I, I think it might have been Robert Downey Sr. I mean, that guy must have been pushing 70, you know? Have you looked in the mirror recently? Listen, mate. I may be no spring chicken, but I don't look that rough, do I? I mean, the wrinkles on my face are all laughter lines. Nothing's that funny. Anyhow, the situation went downhill from there. No one was focused enough. 2D couldn't understand the difference between film and reality. Murdoch got himself kicked out of the Playboy mansions for stealing ashtrays. And Russell got a big fat ego and then changed his name to R. Diddy. So eventually we decided to cut our losses and take time off to recuperate. This just lead to further misadventure. So, you know, man, you know, when we realized we were just sort of whistling in the wind, we decided to have a break from each other. So I headed down south to try my luck in Mexico, yeah, Mexico. Yeah. But you know, there was some sort of mix up, you know, my final Finances and I, I, I kind of got yeah, accused yeah, of them. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was found using counterfeit checks in a Mexican brothel. Uh, yeah, the chicken choker. Mm, wonderful place and fantastic staff. You know? Happy days. <laughs> Basically, he got caught passing dud checks off as payment to the girls. And consequently, murder got taken to jail. Yeah, yeah, all, all, all right, Russell. Russell spent a long time trying to recuperate. He ended up living in Ike Turner's basement. Ike Turner! You went a wee bit mental, didn't you, Russell? Well, he certainly looked a lot like Ike Turner. I was working on an album of my own, but eventually it felt like the album was working on me. It was a strange time. When you work in a band with people for such a long period, and then that suddenly stops, it can leave you at a loss. I think I had some kind of breakdown. I just lost one of my closest friends, Dale, the spirit who used to live inside me, and the strain was starting to show. Mm. 
every song I tried to record would become a hallucination. Then the hallucination would try to write the song, which would then get up and become yeah, yeah, another... Yeah, 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 Russell, Russell, man. It's probably... It's what? probably... No, no. I'm sorry. No, it's man. It's all right. It's I'm sorry. Right. Take it easy, man. Take it easy. Have a salad, you okay. know. It's probably best, you know, not to dig too deep on this one. Yeah. Yeah. Dark place, man. Dark place. Mm. So, anyway, after 18 months in this sort of Tijuana jail, I thought, enough is enough. And uh, with a little help from my friends, I got myself sort of out and back home to Blighty, and the good old U of the K. But I tell you, that's enough South America for me for a while. You know, the prison food is rubbish. I, I, I don't think I could eat another burrito in my life. Yeah, but you still like a bit of Mexican sausage, eh, man? <laughs> Shut up, you little fuck. Mm. So, by the time I got back, her Noodle had also returned from her trip to her Japanese homeland and was already in the process of recording the new album, or, you know, at least laying down a lot of the groundwork. Yes, uh, I had been in Japan for about a year, uh, researching my past, as it had always been a, a mystery to me. Uh, it was during this period that uh, I was awoken from my extended amnesia, and in doing so, I discovered many interesting facts about myself, uh, one of which is that I knew English language fluently. Having been revitalized, I returned to England and I began to lay foundation for a new Gorillaz album. However, Kong Studios, uh, where we live and record, had been lying dormant and empty during our absence. Oh, uh, yeah, you know, it's hard to get good staff to clean a haunted studio. Yes, no one had maintained the building and it had also been broken into. There seemed to be a, a plague of the walking undead infesting the building. Corpses lined the corridors. So once we were back, you know, it took a a little while to get into the swing of things. Yeah. I mean, it can be very distracting when you got six or seven decomposing zombies stuck up your chimney flue. You know? We got chimney flue? I'm speaking metaphorically, D. I'm using the analogy of a chimney flue to describe the um, passageways of our flowing creativity. The zombies in this case are used as a metaphor. As in blockages to the airways, figuratively speaking. Really? No. They really are about six or seven undead carcasses stuck up the studio chimney. Yeah, that would explain the smell, wouldn't it, yeah? I stayed round in Los Angeles for a while. I got invited to stay round Brick Eklund's flat. But, you know, she's nuts. Running around naked, banging on the walls half the night. I never got any sleep. So I nod off back to my dad's place on the coast of England. I got a temporary job, like, work on the rise at my old man's, like, fun fair, which was wicked, really. It did a lot for my confidence, yeah? I put up with a lot less crap than that geriatric Murdoch now. Oi, you. Pass us the ashtray. Now! Yeah, certainly, sir. Here you go. I originally discovered the building, which now houses Kong Studios, back in 1999. I was looking for a cheap studio space on the internet, and it threw up this little gem. It's located on a hilltop in, in Essex, and believe me, there aren't many hills in Essex. Mm, there's one in Langdon, I think. Mm. But it, it wasn't until we'd sort of been there for a year or so that we discovered the truth about the place. Mm -mm. Oh, horrible. It turns out the original site for the building was like a druid's meeting point. It was picked specially for its unique alignment of dark energies and hideous ley lines. The first Kong building was erected on top of an old disused cemetery. A lot of people who died in the Great Plague of 1665 were dumped there in shallow graves and burial pits. Poor people. Yeah. Poor people. Uh, the current building here, you know, where our studios are, is situated next to one of the biggest landfill sites in the country. So it's like sort of, you know, it's full of old fridges, nappies, colostomy bags, rotten cows, you know, all sorts. You know. Just, just, you know, just barely buried, you know. And in the middle of the summer, you know, when it gets hot, the stench is unbelievable. It, I don't know, man, it's like someone cooking turds or something. I don't know. So, so, and no, no one seems to sell efficient air freshener in Essex. No, no. I mean, the, the last owners were this kind of biker gang, you know, these cats who used to sort of use the building as their clubhouse. You know, they call, they, what are they, what are they called? Oh, yeah, man, they're called the nomads. 
but uh, uh, they'd chosen to settle there for some reason. Anyway, one night they all got caught in a fire in the building, yeah. Burnt to a crisp. <laughs> Which uh, no one told us about when we bought the place. <laughs> oh, man, that place is full of bad spirits and sick vibrations. Still, you know, we gave it a lick of paint and hung up a couple of posters. Uh, yeah, it looks great. Uh, it's got underfloor heating already installed, so uh, ah, it can't be all bad, eh, kids? <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, the website gorillas.com allows our online fans to roam around the uh, Kong Studios building. As the place acts as a home, our studios and the Gorillas HQ, there's a lot for people to see and do. Uh, there are interactive cameras in every room and corridor of the building, allowing people to see right into their lives. They can use the instruments in the studio room or talk to the characters that hang out there. Yeah, yeah there's, like, there's like various places they can go. It's also the place where the fans can interact with each other on the message boards and now we got our own auditions room where people can send in their tapes and animations and work noodles currently running a competition to find new talent maybe someone to work with the gorillas in some way we've had some fantastic entries and there's like three or four floors to the building now right and you can like take look around our bedrooms yeah um why would anyone want to look around your bedroom uh, basically we spent a lot of money extending the place putting more and more parts onto it it's been broken into a couple of times whilst we've been away some vandals sprayed a lot of anti-murder graffiti on the walls. Uh, things like Murdoch is a twat and uh, things like Murdoch is a you twat. You mongrel. Still in the mood, aren't you? Because Busted split up. Mm. Also, the producer we've been working with, Danger Mouse, found a whole underground section of the place that had been blocked off for years. Pretty creepy. Um, oh, I'm really parched, you know. I'm spitting feathers. Uh, is there anybody who could get me a beer around here? Anywhere at all, you can get one of those things. <laughs> Noodle started working on the initial sketches of the album while we were all still kind of preoccupied you know well, lucky for her i i would left a very specific set of instructions as to how the new song should you know sound that, that, that was just a, a tape of you humming yeah cha. actually noodle wrote most of the album herself murdoch may try to take the credit for it but from the basic sketches to the finished album this was Noodle's vision. Hi. So, uh, I started writing near the beginning of the year, around March of 2004. I began just writing basic tunes on my Tascam 4 track, uh, sketching out ideas as I proceeded. Uh, once I had what I felt to be the main outline and template for the album, I started laying uh, uh, further textures, uh, melodies and sounds over the top. The compositions began to take shape, and gradually, the songs began revealing their true identities and to which direction they needed to be taken. But at this stage, they lacked that certain life and still required that uh, a spark of electricity that transforms a great song into something that has a magical life of its own. Well, you know, I, I would have helped her out, but uh, as I said, I was uh, still in jail at this time, you know. And yes, and it was around then that I heard uh, of DJ Danger Mouse. Uh, I was impressed with the work he had done on his own grey album, which I had done long from the internet. Uh, on the Grey album, he had spliced together the work of the Beatles and Jay-Z to create something new. Um, it was wonderfully inventive and showed a childlike uh, creativity, um, artistic bravery and disregard for convention that I thought suited gorillas. So I contacted him. Then what happened? Well, it took a while to convince him to work with Gorillaz. Yeah, I think he was at ease relaxing on his new island. 
just kind of burning through all the cash he made off the Grey album sales. Well, he, he wasn't overly keen on leaving sunny LA mm. to, to go and work in a rundown haunted studio in rain sodden Essex. Mm. Although, I can't think why. Me neither. But, um, girl, let's have ways of making it work. Shh. Come the on, the album took a leap into the incredible when the producer Danger Mouse finally arrived. This would be around uh, uh, June 2004. Uh, Mr. Mouse and myself immediately began an intricate pre-production session. Yeah, this, this mainly involves sort of playing table tennis and listening to a load of old electro records. He's, he's an odd-looking fellow, you know, that Danger Mouse. He's got like this, you know, sort of, sort of like huge hair, you know. No, I, I mean really, really big hair. <laughs> he, he looks a little bit like that David Blaine cat. You oh, know, oh, with, oh, with oh, a oh, wig, oh, like he's got a wig on. You know? No, no. Uh, yes, so uh, the recording session became more intense, and the more we proceeded, the more in synchronization we became. Danger Mouse is a very... Uh, instinctive and insightful producer. Uh, he looks to find the, the relevance or sort of a song. Mm, mm, so, and then uh, once he had located the particular voice of a track, he will then make it talk to the other compositions around it. This way the album works as a complete article. As the full understanding of what we were making became apparent, we began to draft in various collaborators to add certain souls to the relevant tracks. Each artist would have to complete the uh, expedition all the way to the summit of Kong Studios in order to record. Although some of the latest submissions have been delivered via digital phone lines from around the globe. So I, I finally got back around October, and then, what's his name, um, 2D turned out, Hello? And then Big Russell got back from his uh, little mental vacation late last November. <laughs> Noodle and Danger Mouse basically called us in to do our parts. For 2D to do his vocals, Murdoch to redo some bass lines, and any other collaborators were called in as and when we needed them. But apart from that, they've been highly secretive about the whole recording. They didn't even let the other gorillas really hear it. Yeah, I didn't want to. Finally, when we knew we had what we needed, we all fled the confines of Kong and set up camp over at the uh, Pierce Rooms in West London. It was here that we added the last of the overdubs and worked on the final mix down. Oh, I'm bored of all this. Oh, anyone fancy a quick Shh, time? Shut up, man. Do I have a cow, man? And it was during this period that we isolated the songs which also were standout tracks musically, uh, didn't fit in with the overall sensibility of the album. Uh, they were then, then removed, yes, and uh, there was a song that seemed uh, mm, maybe part of a different dialogue and would have interrupted the arc of the album's narrative. It had to be focused and efficient, uh, a consistent thought. Yes. You see, it's all in the edit. The album was then mastered over in New York, January 2005, and that was it, completed. Yeah. Well, so it came out pretty well like I told her to make it in the first place. Mm. The album opens with an ominous, swirling soundscape of voodoo-esque percussion, keyboard bassoons, and sirens. You can tell there's big trouble ahead. This uses a sample taken from the Georgie Romero film, A Dawn of the Dead. We use this because it expressed a similar sense of foreboding about the world that we feel at this time too. Uh, there's a sense that people in some certain quarters are working on motorized instinct as unthinking automatons rather than with any genuine humanity, uh, sensitivity or understanding of the consequences of their actions. No, no I thought we used it because I like the zombie films, yeah? It's this wicked bit, right, and the zombies tear off the biker's arm, yeah? Yeah, and yeah, well, whatever, you know. It's, it's from some stupid zombie flick and we, we thought it set the rest of the album up quite well. Next. This is built up around a simple rhythm. Sonically, there's a nod to the early drum machine sounds that appeared on the second special Yeah, album. well, it's like a kind of dub meets like European cinema thing. Yes, thematically, it's a continuation of the intro sensibility. Sometimes the climate we live in um, can make you feel like you are one of the few sentient beings left. 
that maybe the ability to have sensitivity to life can make you feel like the outsider. A lone trooper. The spirit of the moment can be uh, quite isolating. Uh, the evidence that we are sometimes presented is that being conscious and cautious of your actions can be viewed as a weakness or hindrance, and not necessarily the most useful ability in this day and age. Yeah. Odd that, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, it can make you feel like the last living souls on Earth, good or bad. Musically, the sense of introspection is reflected in the acoustic and piano refrains. It's a harmonious battle between digital and acoustic. And if you listen really closely, there's some old geezer coughing in the background. <laughs> This is a more down-tempo track, like nighttime maneuvers, the equivalent of creeping up on the enemy. Hey, and as a progression of the album's narrative, there is a sense of being forced into a, a position of having to arm your children. The arms are ambiguous, but there is a definite sense of conflict on the way. Desensitize yourself before you get taken advantage of. Uh, they're turning us into monsters is an expression of that transition of training people how to lose their compassion. It's a jungle out there. Yeah, sometimes it makes me wonder how I keep from going under. What's the name of the girl who sings on this one? Lovely lady. Very <laughs> helpful. Uh, th thank you, thank you. This track features a guest vocal from Nina Cherry. I loved her Raw Like Sushi Bigo album. She's always had a positive, collaborative attitude towards music. Seven Seconds with Your Son Door is a superlative tune. Yes, and towards the outro, there's a moment of subdued tension that then allows itself to explode into space, and then the track soars off into the distance. A repetitive piano note stabs away like a... Uh, like a slowed-down version of the Stooges. The restraint in the earlier section of the song is actually what gives it the power at the end. Mm, so, and the key is maybe in the words, uh, pacify. You know, if I have to die, I want to go in my sleep like my dad. Not screaming and like yelling like all his passengers. This song is the sound of someone's train coming off its coasters, the match of the madman. We gave 2D's vocals a distorted megaphone effect as this fitted the soul of the track. Um, it is to make the vocal section seem like a, a memory from the past. Yeah, like some old vaudeville track. Yeah, like some old vaudeville track. Uh -huh. Is there an echo in here? And uh, some of the spooky sounds on this track were caught on tape by accident. Um, it is believed that they are the mysterious recordings of paranormal experiences going on at the Kong Studios. Um, if you listen really carefully, you can hear a growling and whispering in the background. Uh, for this reason, this track was almost left off the album, but it was decided it should remain as the track came out so well. And it's not like gorillas aren't used to dealing with runaway spirits. Uh, musically, there's a tip of the hat to Bernard Herrmann's atonal string score from the Hitchcock movie Psycho. Mm, so, and the, the intention of the vocal line is a, a reminder to keep a little greenery in your heart, or you may forget what you were fighting for in the first place. And that really is the domain of the undead. Yeah, the, this one ends ominously on the haunting sound of a bell ringing into the distance. Ask not for whom the bell tolls. Well, why not? It tolls for thee. Really? Yes, really. It sounds like my alarm clock. Exactly. This was one of the first tracks I worked on with DJ Danger Mouse. It evolved from a tape recording from an old gorilla's jam. A Danger Mouse added the kids' choir, the San Fernandez Youth Chorus. Um, when they heard the track, they were really excited to sing along on it. Ah, uh, kids, eh? Little treasures. I love them. Couldn't eat a whole one, though. <laughs> this track is a real, upbeat, defiant, jubilant soul. Musically, it's got a real old-school break cut up in it. I played a kind of Clyde Stubberfield, Bernard Purdy rhythm. Those two were so massive in my drum palette, the foundations of hip-hop. 
you dig? I also try to add a little feel of a uh, Ziggy Boom release from the meters. And once I had the swing and the sound right, I then cut up the drums again to give it that extra sharp edge. That's when 2D added the clavinet keyboard rhythms. Yeah, that was just something I heard of Sesame Street. The rap on this verse is supplied by Booty Brown from the far side, who came in courtesy of a friendship with Danger Mouse. Yes, and we talked with him about general themes and atmospheres rather than anything specific. But he hit the nail on the head with this great rap. Um, I feel that Booty's rap humanizes the position of the soldier, the fighter as an individual. War will make soldiers of us all. The rap's got some killer lines. You can't conceal the hate that consumes you. I'm the reason you can fill up your Zuzu. Poultry man. With this track, there's a sense of infecting the young. Um, as a civilization, we seem to be taking something of their innocence away with a lot of images of conflict that are, are constantly being displayed. For a lot of kids, their earliest memories will be these dramatic images. That's like putting chemicals in the food chain. These kids are growing up out of a climate of conflict where intolerance has been encouraged and there's a sense of uh, fighting for something you'll be manipulated into backing. It can't be good in the long run. No, can't be. And this addition of the arabesque string section, I think, provides a balanced view musically. Don't patronize your kids. They pick up on more than you realize. I think one of the core reasons why gorillas are successful is that we never patronize kids. Their understanding and intelligence is already in there, right from the beginning. Um, Russell... If you touch my leg one more time in this interview, I'm calling the cops, okay? This track, Feel Good Inc., was chosen to be the first single from the album. We thought it would be an upbeat and dynamic return. Part Billie Jean, part Rockwell. The beat on this is as infectious as influenza. We asked our friends De La Soul to lend a rap to the song, so they came over to the studio and hung out for the day. In the evening, they delivered this crazy, gooning, fun rap. Yeah, sounds like a bunch of kids trapped in a photo booth. Three Foot High and Rising was such a milestone record in terms of giving a lot of people an entry point into hip-hop. A huge statement of intent, so colorful, so full of life and humor, and just real good energy. Their Daisy Age motif stood for the inner soul, y'all. So you know they're heading in the right direction. They also have a playfulness when it comes to cutting and pasting different styles together. It's rare in hip hop to have a track like this that really works at this speed. A real up-tempo beat. Uh, that reminds me, Pastor Noose still owes me five pounds. Uh, uh. I'll give him a call. The windmill imagery line is a representation of a, a note of optimism, a memory of a, a simpler time, uh, like maybe a snapshot of an older world, more innocent. The production on 2D's vocal passages reflects this sensibility again, like an image beaming at you from the past. A ghost of a memory. However, it is for this reason that we remove the effect for the second appearance of this section in the song, so that this image becomes more direct, uh, clear and present. Then it drops straight back down into De La Soul's nitrous oxide fuel rap. Coupled with the heavyweight beat, this cut is unstoppable. Yeah, heavy. Shut up, man. <laughs> This opens up with the sensation of uh, drifting, as if maybe a float in a sensory deprivation tank. Or maybe like you've just woken up in a bath. In Spain. Ah, yes. And the track provides a moment of internal dialogue, uh, laid over a staccato ballad. This composition was the very last to be written and provided the uh, necessary feel for the midpoint of the record. Yeah, it arrived like a winning goal in the last few seconds of a match. It sounds like a digital soul record with Spanish syncopation. I played this track to, to that bloke, Cristina Aguilera, the other day. It's a funny-looking girl, isn't he? Yeah, you know, he looks a lot like the singer of Twisted Sister or that, or that, that other bloke, um, Courtney Love. Ugh. 
every planet we reach is dead. An image of catching a glimpse of your soul at the battlefield uh, from above. I lost my land. This is, how do you put it? Uh, an unloaded question. A soft proposal to question ourselves and our decisions. There's a Charles Bukowski quote that goes something like, if you're losing your soul and you know it, then you still got a soul left to lose. You can kind of hear the sentiment in the line, I lost my way, what am I going to do? Hey, Russell, have you been eating onions? Mm, the piano solo on the outro is supplied by Mr. Ike Turner. It's real easy to forget the influence that Ike had on music. I mean, James Brown learned a lot of his showmanship and work ethic from Ike and his Kings of Rhythm band very early on. Ike's Rocket 88 in 1951 is widely regarded as being possibly the first true rock and roll record. Yeah, he really lets loose at the end of this one. Good old Ike. Yeah, he's like really knocking seven shades of sh sh shine out of the piano, isn't he? It's right back down to earth on this track. The beginning sounds like an old wham record. This features a rap supplied by London-born rapper MF Doom. MF Doom has rapped under several different identities. He started out as Zev Love, the mastermind of KMD. He's also released a couple of albums as MM Food, but he appears on this track as MF Doom. MF stands for Metal Face, and the Doom bit is uh, in part a tribute to the Marvel Comics supervillain Doctor Doom, the iron enemy of the Fantastic Four. Doom recently hooked up with a producer Madlib for the excellent 2004 Mad Villainy album. Oh, funnily enough, I had that playing on my iPod when I crashed my quad bike the other day. <laughs> This is a massive swinging, bouncing hip hop track featuring a machine gunning rap from London's own Roots Maneuver. Rootsy's vocal just kind of dances between this huge, rolling, circular beat. Yeah, like a boxer filled up with brandy. Roots Maneuver has been dropping by Kong Studios on and off since we started. I thought his Run Come Save Me album was incredible. And Gorillaz have talked about collaborating with him for a long time. Yeah, he's told me loads of times that I'm his best mate. Mm, it would be a limitation to say that Roots Maneuver is at the forefront of UK hip-hop as a rapper. He's at the forefront of hip-hop, full stop. His qualities and vocal imagery create a universal sound. And he's set to become such a dominant force in music worldwide. He's a British Dr. Zeus. Uh, Russ, are you from Texas? All alone, um, maybe the sense of isolation is a hard one to shift, and sometimes the feeling carries on into adulthood. And maybe the older people get, they learn to suppress it or ignore it, but it's still there. The additional vocals came courtesy of Martina Topley Bird. Her vocal is so light, warm and sweet. It provides the release in this case. We met her through mutual friends that worked on her Quixotic album. I've thought about this for a long time, you know. If, if I really had to choose, if there was no way out of it, I would have to say prawn cocktail is probably my favorite flavor of crisp. This is the most punk rock sounding track on the album. A real pumping powerhouse. The drums really motor along. It's relentless. Hey, this is more like it. The guitar line on this track is played by one of the Mexican inmates that Murdoch brought back with him after his time in jail. They helped him escape. Now Murdoch owes them. Yeah, well, I mean, they're both good guys when you get to know them. Yeah. A part of Murdoch's payment was to allow them to appear on the new Gorillaz album. Hence the slightly, uh drunken nature of the guitar playing? Alcohol is one of the way we suppress our indecisions. Uh, certainly one of the better ones, love. Beer is proof that God loves us and wants us to be happy. The clouds part briefly halfway through the track before the second wave kicks in. Steal the nerves, remove the doubt. Uh, this is no world for overanalyzing our emotions. Well, yes, you know, in this day and age, you've got to be like Dr. Spock sometimes and just look at things unemotionally. Mr. Spock? Huh? In Star Trek, it wasn't Dr. Spock, it was Mr. Spock. Everyone makes that mistake. Oh, whatever. Christ, I hate you so much. This song is about the relentless fury of alcohol, the focused drive and the singular thirst that 
That kind of desire creates、uh, one man's passion is another man's addiction. Oh, yeah, some drunk tramp did the vocal for this song. You know, the white light bit. He sang it into a dictaphone for us one morning when he was slumped in the heat down by the canal. Uh, sorry, did you just call me a tramp? You better watch your lips, Sonny.、Huh? This is a hefty track. Part Clash, part Madonna. Uh, you know what? That's a rubbish description. It's got nothing to do with Madonna. It's got, it's got a vocal by my old mate Sean Ryder. <laughs> Sean, eh? <laughs> he's a scallywag, isn't he? <laughs> no, he's from Manchester. Scallywags are from Liverpool. Yeah, all right, cheeky chops. But, you know, he's singing it like he's from Liverpool. I mean, the lyrics go, it's coming up, it's coming up, it's coming up, it's there. But he's going, it's there, you know,、uh, man, and all that, la. Hence why the title of the song got changed from it's there to dare, as in it's dare. And that's why he's a scallywag. Got it? Yeah, it's all gravy, bruv, yeah. Oh, I know, no, no, seriously, don't start with all that rubbish. Jesus. Sean Ryder was the singer of the Happy Mondays. A huge influence on so many people. As a lyricist, he was one of the only true voices and documenters of the late 80s, early 90s period. You can tell he's an original because he spawned so many imitators, not just musically, but in his lifestyle and the way he spoke, right down to his sense of humor and his taste in clothes. Balls. When he came into the studio, he was like, Oh, I say, what time's tea then?、Um, do I have time to lay down some of my singing before we retire to the drawing room? Marvellous. Suva. All that Manx street tour is just a big put on for the cameras. Sean's really just a big posh kid. I think emotionally, where this song fits on the album is that despite all the lows, there are great highs. There's a sense of camaraderie on this track. It's tough. This track went through many manifestations before finally settling itself in this form、uh, a big shiny gorilla's tune. It's there! This tale is about balance. You must be able to open your eyes without being poisoned by the evil you can see. And even innocence must prepare to fight when it's necessary. Apathy is a decision with consequences, and you must take action when necessary. Without losing sight of what you're fighting for, the tale on this track is narrated by Mr. Dennis Harper. Noodle ran into him at some award show, and it turns out he knew some gorilla's tracks already. We told him what we were working on, and he took it from there. He came down to the studio for an afternoon and, you know, put his presence on the record. Aha, Dennis Hopper. Oh, you know, Denny, Denny, Denny. Ugh, he had such a big effect on me. Nowadays, he's become a symbol for that particular type of hedonistic narcotic energy. And he's got some killer bikes. He's being a spokesman for free creativity and ignoring the rules at the risk of holding your own sanity to ransom. Therefore, a natural gorilla's cohort. Hopper's highway has always been to take the William Blake route of excess to reveal a palace of wisdom. I can relate to that. But his journey was fueled by a desire to uncover the truth, or maybe something just more truthful with more value. The backdrop to his classic Easy Rider film was an America in transition period after the ravages of the Vietnam War. And filmed in an age in which people were questioning the wisdom of their political system. He seemed like an astute choice to feature on this track. Yeah, and he, and he was great in speed as well. This little parable that Dennis narrates is a short story that Noodle wrote in the style of Herman Hesse, a childlike fable of a people too good hearted to see the steady influx of other people with、uh, a darker agenda. Yes, a.、Uh Both groups depicted are extreme portraits of the people they are meant to represent, but this is to show how the two sides,、uh, ignorant to the position of the other, will clash.、Uh, this result in a, a devastating loss for all, in which no one won. I sold Dennis my old Winnebago while he was down at Kong, you know, so I, I sort of said I'd knock a bit off the price if he gave us the vocal. This is a little slice of West Coast sun soaked harmony. The part this plays is as a transition into a more optimistic exit for the album, like coming up for air. For the orchestrated harmony, we drafted in the London Community Gospel Choir. This works as a prelude 
or link to the next track. The message is、uh, Don't get lost in the fog. Again, it's saying Beware what you can lose by losing sight of the gold. Or maybe Don't let the negative events cloud over the bigger picture. Or you can lead a horse to water, but you can never get it to pay your phone bill. <laughs> Christ, come on, get on with it. I've got a plane to catch. As with the previous track, the vocal harmonies were provided by the London Community Gospel Choir. You remember when you were a little kid and you would look at the clouds in the sky as the sunlight bounced off them? And something that simple would make you feel a part of everything. And all alone at the same time. And that feeling is not something you can ever put into words. So you spend your whole life chasing it, making music, taking pictures, painting, whatever, in the hope that other people will understand that sense or feeling. As creative entities, we look for signs of life outside ourselves, for a connection to alleviate the sense of solitude. That's why we all do what we do. Whether we know of ourselves or not. Uh, nope. Still not getting you, mate. It is and will always be for the birds after the show. Anyone who says any different is just spinning you a yarn.、Oh, okay, you maybe you're right then. The track's a positive reassurance. Today's a new day. We still have everything to gain and a universe to fight for. This is the album's exit, the flip side to the intro. It's a very uplifting and optimistic finale to the album. As the beginning presents the listener with the sensation of being alone, isolated, and the end feels more like a universal connection. Hmm, really? Do go on. Just be aware to keep your senses alive. Don't desensitize yourself to life just because it's a struggle and can be painful. Because if you avoid it, you'll lose more than you'll ever know. Yeah, um, I see. All we really have in life is the ability to feel and understand. If you remove that part of yourself in order to fight, then you have lost the battle at the start. To be an unconscientious objector is of no real value. Sorry,、um, did, did you pick that up? The immediate difference is that Murdoch was largely responsible for writing the first album, whereas this record is mostly the work of our guitarist Noodle. Only because I was in prison, mate, and I could have written this album standing on my head.、Mm. As a body of work, Demon Days is more focused and considered than the first album. Maybe it has greater gravity to it than the first record, where we were still kind of learning the ropes. It was important not to make the second album referential to our success, or even relative to the first album. It was also important for us to, to change our target.、Uh, fortunately, the world provided us with enough external stimulus and subject matter not to have to force the issue. Stylistically, it's richer, denser, darker. It also reflects a little of the、uh, mental state that we found ourselves in. I speak for myself here. Which is why tracks such as Old Green World have elements of disorientation in them.、Oh, I've always had elements of disorientation to me, you know. Well, when I can find them. Again, as the range of our influences is so extensive, it reflects that understanding of so many styles the hip hop, the rock, the funk, the bass, right down to the ballad. This is a whole community of instruments at play. Tiny little textures and phrases that work in harmony and complement each other. Not that outlandish a concept, really. Last time, it was about creating something new. This time, it's more about proving that what we created and put into motion last time had a lasting value. That our gorilla sound, sensibility, and insight wasn't a, a flash in the pan. Here today, gone tomorrow sensation. Any fool can have a hit record. 2D can vouch for that. You gotta have a real soul and talent to sustain it again and again. Um, unfortunately, I'm not the current owner of my soul. I'm saying we'll see how good we are seven albums down the line. It's a test of faith. Most great bands and crews tear themselves apart real soon. But the real trick is to tear yourselves apart and then put it back together differently. 
better. The music has a stricter discipline to it, with an undercurrent of dark optimism. It contains a kind of variety of pagan electro sounds, but the album has a fuller breadth of vision this time round. I mean, it's still heavy on the bass, but less dub, more hip hop. But it also contains a lot of old England pastoral soul, humanist sonics, if that makes sense. Um, not really. <laughs> Like someone's taken the first album and coloured it in. The sort of the recording can avoid being a, a manifestation of the time, climate and location of the place we were in when it was made. Consequently, the colours are rich, dark and heavy, while the rhythms are clean, strategic and relentless. It has a, a consciousness to it. The stuff I used to listen to as a kid, like Public Enemy, had a great combination of information, intelligence and entertainment. Chuck T's conscious message coupled with Flavor Flav's big clock wearing tomfoolery. I grew up on stuff like Wire, Magazine, The Clash. Stuff that had great rhythms, great songs and sharp lyrics. You never grew up, Twerp. You're like a five-year-old trapped inside a blue-haired anorexic girl. <laughs> it was the procedure of recording this that became the education. The final outcome is the document, but the journey was the destination. The decision to release this song, uh, Feel Good Inc., as the first single came from Gorillaz as a group, we each get a vote. Although, as is traditional, every one of my votes counts for double of two Ds. Uh, however, uh, the song revealed itself to be the correct choice for a single, although not typical or completely representative of the album, it is a good ambassador for Demon Days as a whole. Do you understand what she's on about? I haven't got a Scooby, mate. I'd leave her to it. Uh, some people contacted us, uh, some we contacted ourselves, and some were already friends of the band. Uh, Danger Mouse came with um, his own network of people. It's always encouraging to meet people we respect and find out that they're already Gorillaz fans too. Sean Ryder, who appears on the track Dare. Yeah, well, you know, he's an old friend of mine. A fellow ornithologist. What's an ornithologist? A bird watcher. We would love to tour this album, but visually it would need to match the ambition and tone of the album. We wouldn't tour again in the same format that we did for the last album. Oh yeah, gorillas on the road! Oh yeah! Hey, 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 you ain't a real band until you've earned your stripes. Gorillas live, you know, it's like a full-on juggernaut. And I need servicing every 200 miles, baby. That's because you clap toes. Touring can be great fun, but if, if you don't watch yourself, it can kind of take you over. You know, gorillas always draws a great crowd. Uh, you know, after the show, you know, I've noticed, you know what I've noticed? There's so many interesting people to me, you know, there's a lot of fun to be had, even with the nutters and stalkers that turn on. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, everyone gets a little excited when something special rolls into town. And I guess a 50-foot cartoon freak show is no exception. Uh, did you see the Brit Awards gig we did, huh? Oh, it was bleeding marvellous. Yeah, there was this rumour that we were playing behind the screen last time round. But we decided to really up the stakes for the new tour, to create a real jaw-dropping experience. We're currently in the process of developing some pretty high-tech technology to make screens walk on stilts and drink fire. Yes, this is very difficult to do. Yeah, especially if you like play instruments and sing at the same time. Ah, uh, it'd be great to tour again. Also, I must mention that as a live drummer, Russell is without a doubt the absolute best in the world. Ever. Yes, that's true. Russell is the greatest live drummer possibly in the history of drums. Yeah, that's totally true, yep. Yeah. There's no one as good as him as a drummer when it comes to playing live. He's the best, he really is, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if it hadn't sold so well and made me the star you see before you now, I would have got all my money back and the old fellow would have broken the terms of the contract, see? Anyway, you know, recording an album you don't think is going to sell is like putting a bet on a horse you don't think is going to win. You know, we, we wouldn't have made it if we thought it wasn't going to sell. Well, Murdoch, some people record music just for the love of making it, whether it sells or not. 
Really? Well, that seems pretty pointless to me. Uh, you got to forgive Murdoch. He's very temperamental. Yeah, half temper, half mental. From the first moment the four of us played together, it was apparent that the combination of ingredients were correct. Uh, special. It is not egotistical to say this, as we were as excited to witness our own performance for the first time as any of our audience would be. Uh, initially, we were our own private audience, and playing together was like a secret event that we couldn't wait to reveal. I would say that it's down to a number of things. My superb bass playing, the incredible songwriting, and the razor-sharp image that makes up the whole Gorillaz package. Though, if you really ask me to pin it down to a single solitary reason, I would probably have to say it was because of the watertight deal I made with Satan, Beelzebub himself. <coughs> Faust is, in fact, my middle name. Man, if the devil went and bought your soul, there's got to be a real shortage of souls for sale. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's easy for you to say. Yeah, well, aside from that, I would have to point out that the competition was truly rubbish. I mean, most bands seem to just limp out there, sort of half-cocked. We made sure our videos looked fan bleeding tastic Our sleeves were mind-blowing, and the music sounded unbeatable. You know, we, we had our whole battle plan together, you know, and we had it down. You know, uh, it was drawn up with military precision. All bit by a bunch of drunk colonels, in your case. I would say that uh, for many groups and artists, there is a desire to add to uh, a tradition or, or a f history of music rather than stand apart from it or, or advance it. They seem happy just to be in a band. For them, that is enough. The other extremes are artists who are willing to push boundaries, but at the expense of their audience, a desire to seem above your listeners or alienate your audience in order to feel above them. I think we represent ourselves in a very non-traditional way, with consideration and forethought, but without pushing people away. We like to warmly invite people into the world of gorillas, which is very detailed and fun without being shallow and facile. It inspires and entertains without being condescending. I think we just assembled our influences and qualities in a certain combination that appeal to people. People just like what we did because it's good. Simple as that. And no one had done what we had done before. And also, I'm good at singing. It's important to have clean, shiny shoes as well, if possible. <laughs> nice, clean, shiny shoes. Right. Now, there was this one time I distinctly remember. I'm, I'm at a big celeb party over at Jack Nicholson's house. Oh, man, please don't tell this story. Uh, I... I, I, got, I got this old hot dog roll, right? I, I sort of put it on my knob, right? Well, actually, I sort of... Ba no, I didn't actually put it on the knob. I, I sort of put my knob in it. And I, I squeezed a load of ketchup over the top, right? So what I do... <laughs> what I do is I, I, I offer this sort of hot dog on a plate to that Alanis Morissette bird. <laughs> she's, she's like tugging away at it and trying to get it off the plate. But it's not coming off, see? So meanwhile, I, I'm making like... Yeah, baby, grab that hot dog, grab it, good time. Listen, boys. man, you gotta stop this. Now, I, I've done this trick about a thousand times, and normally, uh, this is the point when I get thrown out of the party, you know, I get beaten up or whatever, but, but this time, oh yeah, this time, everyone froze. Huh? I said she's... Uh, and then a gentle sort of ripple of laughter and applause went around the room. And you know what? Even old Alanis managed a great big smile. She knew that I'd just caught her out with the old cock dog routine, you know. That is when I realised I had truly arrived. Uh, so did she eat the hot dog? <clears throat> well, eventually, um... See? The nice thing about being a celebrity now is that if you bore the crap out of people, well, they just think it's their fault. <laughs> Hello? Hey, Murdoch. Is El Bandido Pedro? Oh, it's you. I want my money, but 
don't get my money, I'm going to take you and your gorillas and stick them down the toilet. I'm going to grab your cajones. I'll kill you. I'll burn your house to the ground. Don't mess with me. I'm a bandido. Listen, Pedro, you little bugger. I'll bring your sodding taco back as soon as I finish this interview. Ciao, mate. Have a nice day. Who was that? No one. Wrong number. So, any more questions? No? Great. Cheers for that, fatty. Right, I'm off down the pub. Anyone coming? Last one to the bars I want... Oh, mmm. I ought to say, don't look for all of your happiness in just one place. Yeah. I mean, it's okay to ask the big questions in life. Just don't expect any answers. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, don't take it all to... No. Wait a minute. Uh, you should always think... Uh, uh, no, that, that, that's wrong. No, actually, I don't think I've learned anything. And that is a lesson in itself. <laughs>